Welcome to Revolutionize Your Retirement Radio, bringing you insights and strategies to help you create a magnificent and fulfilling second half of life. Here's your host, certified professional retirement coach and best-selling author, Dr. Dorian Mincer. I want to welcome everyone to my fourth Tuesday Revolutionize Your Retirement interview with expert series. I'm Dory Mincer, owner of Revolutionize Retirement and your host for the series. Without further ado, let me get us started because today it's, I think it's going to be a wonderful conversation about the reinvention of age and the reinvention of retirement. Connie Swide, who's my guest, recently retired after 30 years as a therapist. She's co-author of bestsellers Meeting the Shadow and Rom- Romancing the Shadow, and she's author of Meeting the Shadow of Spirituality and A Moth to the Flame, A Life Story of Rumi. It's a novel. She's a certified saging leader and is currently writing The Reinvention of Age, and she's blogging experts, excerpts sorry, of it on Medium. Connie, I am so delighted to have you as a guest here. We met actually at a positive aging conference, and I was at one of your workshops on the shadow and dealing with the shadow as we age. And I thought maybe a good place to start would be, I'm not sure everybody on the call knows about the concept of shadow. A lot of people may, but may not. So maybe if we could start a little of what your writing and work has been, and then it seems like it's going to be a good segue into sort of what's changed for you as you've been reinventing yourself and your life. Dory, thanks so much for having me. I've really enjoyed the calls that I've listened to with your other guests, and I'm really honored to be here today. Let's see. The shadow is a term that was coined by Carl Jung to refer to the personal unconscious. That part of our minds that's below our conscious awareness, but that's having all kinds of influence on us, that's shaping our feelings and behaviors without our knowing it. And his real contribution was to recognize, unlike Freud, who believed that everything unconscious was dark or negative, Jung pointed out from his clients' dreams, from his own inner work, that there was creativity could be in the shadow, positive feelings that had been forbidden could be in the shadow, creative fantasies, spiritual longings could be in the shadow. Many people have written about this and explored it. It's a profound, it deepens our self-knowledge when we can connect with what is going on beneath the level of conscious awareness. So what I realized as I started to explore the world and the literature of aging which is often called conscious aging, is that nobody was really talking about unconscious aging. What are the fantasies and images and feelings that are hidden in the shadow and that might erupt as we age and that might sabotage us as it sabotages us all throughout our lives, might sabotage us to have a really fulfilling late life. I'm adding this new dimension to the aging literature and extending my own work for baby boomers who are finding that as we enter our 60s and 70s and 80s, that there is a part of us that wants to deny what's happening. Denial is a part of it that wants to resist, that wants to distract ourselves. And all of that is material in the shadow that's related to aging. So that's what I'm writing about. That's so exciting, and it really is a an element that I think has not been talked about as much. So I'm really excited to be able to focus more on it today. I wonder if you'd be willing to just share a little of, because I know I've read a little of the blogs that you've done. You went through, you've gone, been going through a process and your own journey of retiring after all these years and thinking about what's next for me. And I wonder if it would maybe be helpful if you could share a little of your journey and then we can proceed with thinking about what are some of the ways we can sabotage ourselves. But I think your journey, I I just find your journey so interesting of kind of some of the questions you were confronting as you decided.
decided it was time to retire. Yeah, so I did write a blog about this on my site on Medium, and I've been writing about it for Next Avenue, and it's a part of the chapter in, in the book. And I think it's a pretty universal story because I've been supporting myself since I was 19. Working as a therapist was my fourth career, and I've really been identified with my doing. I would call it the doer. Other people might call it the provider, or one of my clients called it the driver. One of my clients called it the competitor or the dominator. So it's that part of us, it's that portion of our identity that only feels good about ourselves when we're productive, that feels well-being at the end of the day when we've ticked off our whole to-do list. And I started to recognize that part of myself, the doer, which had really given me great fulfillment and some success, some contribution, was now beginning to sabotage me. In my 69th year of life experience, I began to notice that there was a kind of a restlessness and a questioning about how I was living my life and whether there should be some kind of change. And the doer just kept telling me, no, keep going, keep doing this thing that you've always done because it makes you feel valuable and it helps other people. It contributes to their lives. And what would your clients do without you? And what would your readers do without you? I began to become aware after a lifetime of tuning into these voices, doing my own shadow work, and sitting in meditation and listening to the noise of my mind, I began to become aware that there was internal conflict, that there was a part of me that was calling for a change, for a rite of passage, really, and there was another part of me that was resisting. And this is what I call aging from the inside out or retiring from the inside out because there's so much expertise now about outer retirement and encore careers and the call to service and the call to more doing. And all of that is valuable. But if we're not attuning to these inner yearnings and these inner voices, then we may miss a profound opportunity. We may carry on the role of doing but we may not really complete a rite of passage and emerge into a new life. I'm calling this crossing the threshold from role to soul. So I started to say that, say that once more. I heard what you said, but I'm not sure everybody else did, but I just think it's such an important concept. The crossing the threshold, just say that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm calling this rite of passage, crossing the threshold from role which is what we do, what we've always done, role of caregiver, role of mother, role of provider, role of CEO, role of fisherman, whatever it is, role to soul. And the soul meaning our true nature, who we are beyond the role. And I'm really extending this work into spirituality and making the point that aging can be a spiritual journey if we learn, if we explore how to make that deeper shift. So let me come back to what was going on with me. So I was here, one part of me was hearing a call, right? I wonder what is the meaning of my life now? Who am I now if I'm not the shadow expert? If I'm not helping people all day, who am I now? And another part of me was denying the call. I can't stop. I can't slow down. I'll become invisible. I'll become irrelevant. I won't matter anymore. I won't be helping people. I'll be financially dependent. 
all of those voices were coming up from the shadow to deny the call for a new life. We, most of us need help to heed this call. And it's more than the call to stop working. It's the call to emerge from this rite of passage with a new life. And from my point of view, with more of a spiritual identity. Does that make sense to you? It makes total sense. And I think it's love. It's the inner work of transition that I hear. It's like the emerging and it's the, the new beginning, but the transforming. And in order to get to the point where you can cross the threshold of a new identity, there is that loss and grief of having to give up, as you say, part of the role. And it's hard. And I think the fear, when you were saying the fear of being dependent or the fear of being irrelevant, that just reminds me of the kind of internalized ageism we have. Those are the images of what happens to people when we're no longer productive, when we're no longer doing. And I can go ahead. I just, it just seems so important. Yeah. Yes, exactly right. I discovered a shadow character inside of me that I call the inner ageist. And the inner ageist is exactly what you're referring to. It has carried since childhood these images and fears and concerns and anxieties about older people. And now I'm one of them. And so if I've been rejecting that about other older people all along and projecting them, projecting other onto older people, because, for example, in my case, I had no positive elder in my world when I was growing up, no positive grandparent, no positive mentor until I was in my 20s. And I'm swimming in an ageist culture. That inner ageist, is a shadow figure who is very epidemic in our culture. People are calling now for a a social movement around institutional ageism, which is so important. But ageism from the inside out refers to this inner work, this shadow character in us that's carrying those values. And so it comes up around retirement Partly because here we are, we're now joining that group, which we devalued all of our lives, right? We're now members of that group. And at the same time, gerontologist Rick Moody pointed out to me that retirement is a Rorschach test, which means that we project onto retirement, just like we projected onto age or old age. We now project onto retirement all of the fears and fantasies that we've carried about it all our lives as we watched our parents retire or our grandparents or older friends retire, all those anticipations, oh, I get to have freedom and leisure and do nothing, or those fears, now I'm going to be invisible and irrelevant and useless, all of those inner internal images and feelings and associations are projected onto retirement like a Rorschach test. Remember those pictures where we would see a crab or a plate or a baby or whatever we saw on those projective tests? And retirement is just like that. The role of shadow work here is to begin to make conscious, to begin to bring into awareness those associations and images that have remained unconscious so that we can heed the call, so that they don't sabotage us and we can move through this rite of passage in a creative way. So it sounds like what you're talking about, too, is somehow pulling out from ourselves and not being afraid to look at the internal kind of contradictions that we have, the doing versus being or these images, as you say, of old age, and I, I guess it's also way back when the lifespan was shorter. It was like people retired and then it all went downhill and they died. So it's what I'm hearing from you, and it's this exciting thing of how to hold the both and all these different contradictions so that 
we stop the noise a little bit so we can hear what the calling is <laughs> or hear what it is that we yes. want to go to rather than run from. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. And there are a lot of opposites associated with aging. I'm writing about these opposites all through the book because they're very, they tend to be unconscious in us, but they're pulling on us. Potential versus decline, victory versus success, gain and loss, young and old. In every elder, there is a youth, and in every youth, there is an elder. So these opposites are running in us, and what happens is when we split them, when we choose one over another one, we don't get the full truth of what late life is about. It is about loss, but it's also about gain. And I think our culture has not really aided us in being able to hold both of these stories. And part of it is, as you said, this longevity after retirement is brand new. It's unprecedented. This stage of life doesn't even have a name. It is, in a way, a blind spot until the baby boomers. Now here we are, 10,000 of us turning 65 every day, and this whole and living fairly healthy, financially stable, emotionally stable lives for many people. Not for everyone, but for those of us who are really privileged, like myself, to have our health and being to have financial stability and to be able to explore this time of life for the first time in history. Mm. These questions about meaning and purpose and value are all just arising now in the culture. It's really important. I wanted to stay a little bit with how to, trying to think of how to ask the question, how to tolerate one's restlessness or the nudginess. How long a period did you find yourself, choosing you as an example, as you began thinking something needs to change? Was it a something you were aware of for a while? Did it come on you rather unexpectedly? And did you find yourself wanting not to pay attention to it for a while? I think this restlessness is really important. And it emerges at different stages of our lives. It emerges when there is a call for change. And I've noticed in most of my clients, people think it's a problem. People think they shouldn't feel that way. (laughs) But I reframe this as a whisper of the soul. I've called it in in an earlier book, I called it the holy longing. It's the soul whispering. For I think it's really important, and I see it as a stage of life issue. It's happened for me earlier, and so then when it started happening again, I was able to recognize it and identify that it was coming along with this identity crisis, this question of who am I now, and that there was a connection between that restlessness and that question. I began reading, talking to people, exploring, and I found Rabbi Zalman chapter chapter Shalomi's book, From Aging to Saging, and I decided to actually heard this voice inside my mind. I think I heard it one day when I was meditating. I need an initiation. And that helped me to recognize what the restlessness was about, too. It helped me to recognize that I was entering a new stage of life and that I didn't know where to go for support for that. And so I decided to take the one-year training with Saging International to become an elder because I identified retirement from my clinical practice as stepping into this new stage that I could call an elder, but I didn't know much about it. And through that journey, which was... 2017 to 2018, I really explored what it meant to become an elder and the inner work that's needed to become an elder, to move from senior to elder or from hero in the workplace to elder. 
It's an archetypal shift. It's not just a role shift. So many other cultures have honored elders, and it's cliche now to say that we don't do that in our culture because it's so ageist. But as I experienced that journey and reframed aging as a spiritual practice to become an elder, I became oriented and the restlessness subsided. I became oriented to the meaning and purpose of this time for me. And I noticed that many of the 15 people who went through the program with me also had that internal experience, even though they had a different outcome for their own purpose. I'm very grateful that I was able to find that and that it was such a good fit for me. Mm-hmm. It does sound like it, it, just the timing of it, and it's been very fortunate <coughs> oh, excuse me, for yes. you to, to have it be something that just very clearly was able to give you a new sense of identity, which I think is so important. I wanted to just comment one more thing about the restlessness. I know, I know sometimes people like to say there's this midlife crisis, and I, I'm not a believer. It sounds like it's similar with you, Connie, that I don't know there has to be a whole major crisis, but I do think that as we get older, there is this uh, nudiness or restlessness of is this all there is and what's it about and how can I possibly give up what I'm so familiar with in order for something new. I just think it's so important. For you, what began to arise in kind of the imagining and the idea of not working for money, was that a, did you find that to be a stumbling block for yourself since you had been self-employed and writing and working? Part of this late life identity crisis for me also came in a dream because I'm connected to the shadow. I watch my dreams. And that there was a dream that I opened my book with that was very important about losing my identity. There was a part of me that wanted to reinforce that old identity and sit in my seat and listen to people and help people and guide people because I have a lot of life experience now and people valued it. And then the exchange is, I'm paid for that. And so there was this part of me that wanted to reinforce that role and continue it and continue to be paid for it. But once I had this dream, I realized that if I continued to do that, I would be denying this whisper from my soul. And I would be betraying myself. That's harsh, but that's how I look at it. I would no longer be following my dharma or the Tao or whatever we want to call it. And so for me, it wasn't a hard choice. Now, again, my privilege. My husband continues to work. I have this position that allows me to take this leap. And I want to acknowledge there are other people who financially are not able to do that. And money can be... You have the safety net, yeah. I have the safety net because Neil continues to work. He's not there. He doesn't want to stop working. He's a psychologist and he loves it. I'm very fortunate in that way. And there are many, millions in fact, millions of baby boomers who are not able to financially retire. And either they have debt or they have adult children and grandchildren they take care of, or for a lot of women, they didn't earn enough to save enough. So I recognize that there's a privilege here in what I'm talking about. But for me, this was not that big a dilemma because I'm. this is how I've lived my life. I've followed my inner call, and this became really clear to me. There are people who went through the Saging International process who are now teaching workshops and charging money for them. And so there is a way to get some income through this journey. That's secondary for me. So for me, money was not a hindrance. 
I would say it was more about the fears of giving up my doing and what that would mean. And when this book came up, Dory, this book is still doing. It's still doing. Mm -hmm. I said to myself, I would now, I meditate an hour a day, and I said to myself I would meditate twice a day rather than once a day and that I would do this book differently than the other books in the sense that my pace is different. So I've been writing for several years. I'm trying not to push myself into the doer from inside, but rather to follow a gentler pace, a kind of, I would say, rather than my ego writing the book, there's a sense of the book coming through me. And so it's a little bit, I've had that with some of, I had that with Romancing the Shadow and A Moth to the Flame. This feels more opening, like opening to it rather than pushing and controlling it. And so there's a different relationship to the doing that's starting to unfold, <laughs> just starting to unfold differently now. And there's a lot of time for self-care, which happens. I'm turning 70 now, so self-care becomes really important. Exercise, nutrition, preventive doctor's appointments, all kinds of things like that take more time now, as well as meditation and friendship and time with my family. There's a different quality to the doing that's becoming more Mm -hmm. familiar it was new in the beginning, and now it's becoming more familiar. I hear that. It sounds lovely, and I love your concept of the whisper of the soul. So it sounds like, if I'm hearing it right, that and it's beginning to take some form for you. It's letting go of some of the structure that you had before and the responsibilities, but it's like building in some additional structures, meditating twice a day or spending time writing and and yeah. has that been an important part for you of developing new I don't know if you think about it that way, but developing kind of new structures that work for you in, in now. Yeah, I don't the word structure feels obligatory to me. I'm moving away from the obligatory feeling. Right now my one obligation is to be with my grandkids on Sunday. And once I'm with them, all sense of obligation disappears <laughs> because it's pure joy, it's pure play. So the rest of my week is about how I choose. I have a dancing lesson in the middle of the week. I just started to take ukulele lessons. It's how I choose to structure the time, whereas before, I had to be in my seat at 9 in the morning to start listening to therapy clients. It's a huge contrast in the structure of my day. And I can wake up and breathe into the space rather than feel a shift. I have to be there for this patient. So that is, when I think talking about opposites, there's a freedom in that. There's also a loss in that. I loved my clients. I loved being there for them and exchanging love with them. So there's a loss in that, too. And so I think each of these shifts is complex. They're not simple. And they're not simple to achieve, either. In terms of becoming an elder, I feel like I'm still moving into that archetype. I've been interviewing lots of people about that. I posted a blog interview with Michael Mead about reinventing the elder today. Because I don't, it's not about stepping into what other, how other cultures define elder in different times and different places. It's about reinventing the elder now as baby boomers, just like we reinvented music and we reinvented health and we reinvented work and we reinvented marriage. 
now we're reinventing this stage of life in really interesting ways. And when I talk to people, they're very unique. They're very unique and sometimes eccentric ways of creating this stage of life. There's an excitement. There's an excitement. It's full of possibilities and, and potential. And at the same time, there's also decline and loss health issues, loss of loved ones. I spent a lot of last year as a caregiver, Dory, for two mm -hmm. friends of mine. That, that is in the mix. This is not all positive feelings. They're, it's all in the mix. Right. Yeah. So I don't want to just be painting a rosy picture here. I lost a very dear friend and another one who's still struggling, and I was really up close in their health crises. I think retirement, its for me, it's not what I imagined as a child. When my father retired in his 50s, he did nothing but play bridge and go out to lunch for the rest of his life for more than 30 years. And that was my only model of... of of the R word, that was all I had ever seen. But I said to myself, boomers reinvented everything else, so this is not going to be my father's retirement. And yep. it's definitely not. <laughs> and that's the exciting part of it. I'm going to start integrating a few of the comments and questions now, if it's okay. There's more, so much yeah, more great. to talk about. That. But I do also want to remind people that Connie has very gracious on this coming Tuesday at noon Eastern to join my Boomers and Beyond special interest group. And when the, and it's a smaller group and it will be able to interact with her. So I, I'm going to be inviting people. If you want to come, I'm going to have, when the recording link is sent out afterwards, I'm going to have the phone number be included. You don't have to RSVP for it, but it will be a smaller call to be able to talk in more depth about this. So one of the questions, there's some comments and questions, and I'm going to integrate both. And you've been talking a little about it, but Denise from New Mexico says, can you just share a little more specifically, how, how does one move through the shadow stuff? How do you make more conscious some of these things so that you have it at your, so you're able to work with it? The book Romancing the Shadow is really about my method. So let me see if I can say it in brief for you. So as you listen to the noise in your mind, if you just take a few minutes and sit and listen, if you have a meditation practice, you can center yourself and listen. If you don't, you can just sit and listen. What, what, and say to yourself, retirement, and see what comes up. Because associations will immediately arise in your mind, idle, useless, irrelevant, invisible, boring, free, golf, swimming, traveling, leisure, alone, scary, lonely. You begin to notice the associations, with, if we're, since we're focusing on retirement, we'll use that. And you can see that it's like a Rorschach test, that you're projecting all these ideas and feelings onto retirement. And you can begin to ask yourself, depending on where you are in your stage of life, if you're, are you anticipating retirement in the next few years? Are you saying to yourself, I'll never retire, it's a bad word? Are you, so where are you in your life in relation to these fantasies and feelings? Okay, are you already retired? I have a lot of people emailing me now because I've been teaching so many workshops and telling me basically the main word that keeps coming back is disoriented. People are feeling disoriented, they're feeling lost. Okay, so if you're before, in the middle of, or after retirement, what are these voices and feelings that are coming up now? Okay. And 
again, if you have a meditation practice, you can get some internal space from them and watch them. That's a really important part of this. You can be able to use self-observation to watch these feelings as they arise so that you don't fall into them and identify with them. So identify would be, I'm invisible now. Nobody cares. I've disappeared. So you're saying, I am. So you're identifying with the voice. And then it becomes a really painful process. And that's where meditation can help give you space from that. Okay, so you recognize there's the voice of a shadow now. And the next question would be, who is that and where does that come from? So I might say to myself, that's my father's voice. My father modeled for me. There's Retirement means you don't do anything and you just enjoy yourself and you live on your savings. So there was, for my dad, there was no emotional planning, there was no financial planning, there was no spiritual planning. He lost his job and that was that. So what comes up for me in that voice, in that shadow character that stems from my own history with my father's retirement is a lot of negative feeling. It doesn't fit who I am. And yet, it's been influencing me from the shadow because he's my only model. So that has been shaping my feelings and concerns, my anxiety and fears about retirement all these years. Who knows how long? Maybe since I was 10 years old. So then you have, so then you're beginning to make conscious, to bring into awareness some of these feelings and images that are ordinarily outside of awareness. And then you can ask yourself, okay, this is a shadow figure. It comes from my dad. It's not who I am. So you begin to work with it as breaking the identification with it. It's not who I am. Who am I, really? Who am I? And... How do I want my retirement? How do I want to create my retirement now or three years from now so I can start planning for it? So the who am I question for some people is about the new role. Who am I in the sense that what role do I want to take on in retirement? And for many people, that means an encore career or a big volunteer project, or it might mean being grandma, or it might mean doing gardening. And for other people, the who am I question is a spiritual question that can carry us into a deeper arena of spiritual work. There's actually a well-known teacher from India named Ramana Maharshi, who's the only practice that he ever taught was to have people ask the question, who am I? Who am I? Who am I? And as the layers fall away, I am not those roles. I am not the doer. I am not the provider. I'm not the mother. I'm not the caregiver. As those roles fall away, we begin to uncover a deeper spiritual identity. So that, for me, was missing in the literature about retirement, and that's part of what I'm writing about. So the work with the shadow can help us disidentify from the voices that can lead us into deeper spiritual work. That's great, and that sounds like a wonderful, wonderful explanation. I think that you've responded so nicely to that question of how to change it for ourselves, how to make conscious a lot of things that just stay inside Here's some questions and comments. Meg from West. First of all, everybody wants to know, I mean, I have a number of questions. Please, what is your website, the blog site, so people can have access to your writings? So maybe you can share that first. My, I'm blogging on medium.com slash at Connie Zweig. 
medium.com slash at Connie's Wise, or you can just go into medium.com and do a search for my name. I'm sure it'll show up. Oh, okay, that's great. Blogging interviews there, as well as some excerpts of the book. And you can also, if you have a problem finding it, just send me an email, Connie at gmail.com. Great. Thank you. Meg had a comment. I have some other comments from people and some questions. She says, wonderful, Meg from Weston in the Boston area, wonderful perspective, deep and wise, personally resonates. Thanks for sharing your personal experience. Then she says, however, there have been significant, there's been significant attention to embracing the paradoxes of aging, seeing the both and perspective as wisdom. People like Bill Sadler, Rep Zalman, Parker Palmer's recent book, Grace, Gravity, Getting Older. Another way to say it, the idea of growing whole. And then she says, I heard an interesting perspective on our cultural addiction to work as parallel to religion and that it gives life meaning and purpose. This person calls it workism and makes it especially hard to give up identity and a role. She said, I can't remember his name right now, but she just wondered if you had any thoughts on this notion of the growing whole and this issue about purpose and meaning and how it fits in and how it relates to work and religion. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I work with the opposites in a Jungian sense. Jung made this famous comment that if we hold the tension of opposites for long enough, a third thing emerges. And I've just lived with that principle. And I see it in my therapy practice. I used to see a lot where people would split the opposites and then what would happen is that the other side would go into the shadow. So that's my model of, and I think the word wholeness for me is abstract and hard to pin down, and I'm more of a developmentalist. So in my chapter on spiritual eldering, I'm going to go into sort of levels of consciousness that are possible from spiritual practices. And that doesn't quite fit with wholeness. It's just a different framework. I do think that work is a religion. I hadn't heard that before. That's a great metaphor. I think that it has given meaning and purpose, and that's really part of the idea, part of the reason that workaholism is so epidemic in our culture. So thank you for that. Excuse me, she also asks, do you have any issues saying yes to too many things? I would say earlier in my life I did. I'm not so much struggling with that now. I'm feeling drawn to learning in certain areas and not in others. I'd say I'm much more discriminating now. Hmm. I know where I want to have fun and what I want to be learning and who I want to be with. That's not my issue at the moment. So Daniel from Iowa says, interesting. He says, yelling ageism at society is a bit convenient for boomers who didn't trust anyone over 30. We're still telling others to change. <clears throat> there's, still, there's some level of individual responsibility for this ageist result. He says, Connie's discussion is more subtle. What can I do myself about age and aging and my own ageism? It's more about I have to change. What are some concrete steps retiring boomers can take to act on or create a more positive self-image of aging? Our experience is that if you're not happy in your work life, retiring is unlikely to flip the happiness switch. But you can lose the happy in retirement if you lose any sense of purpose or meaning. How long do you have for this conversation? (laughs) (laughs) Maybe he'll he'll make sure he joins us on the 5th of March, too, hopefully. (laughs) You're making making several really good points, Daniel. On my blog, I have my experience of finding my inner ageist in there. There's a whole blog in there, and it might help you to do the inner work, which I agree is our account. It's the way that we can be accountable and not just blame the outside. 
not just blame everybody else. I think that we never trusted people over 30 and then 40 and then 50. And here we are now, 60, 70, 80, and we are those people that we didn't trust. The institutions are a reflection of our generational ageism, but not ours alone, because a lot of those structural policies were intact before we got here from past generations. And they do have to be changed, and I think it's really important that there's a whole kind of burgeoning movement about that. But without the inner work, I think the inner work is not enough and the outer work is not enough. And that's what we've seen with every social movement. When I was a protester in Berkeley, screaming, marching, raising my fist in the air for social change, I hadn't done the inner work. And so I was projecting a lot of my own anger from my own personal history onto the institutions and the people in those days who held the power. I can see that in retrospect. At the same time, our generation created the women's movement and gay rights and environmentalism and the health food movement. So much positive stuff happened out of our generation, even though a lot of it was projection. <laughs> Paradox. <laughs> this holding those opposites, I think, that we were talking about, the need for both inner work and social movements. And people now who are talking about sacred activism, I interviewed someone this week who called herself a mystic activist. I think there are Joanna Macy, Roshi Bernie Glassman. There are all kinds of people who have tried to bring inner work and social protest together. And I wish it were happening more today in our generation. I wish it were happening around these issues of aging. But we're just starting to talk about that now. Thank you. So Dorothy from Virginia says, your presentation is so rich. Thank you. I feel like you've normalized the restlessness I'm experiencing and giving me much to think about. My dreams, my projections onto retirement, my sense of identity as separate from the doer, and the interplay of opposites. And let's see, Daniel asks, is there a vacuum of, he maybe responded to this, but let me ask it anyway, is there a vacuum of meaning beyond self, i.e. the ego, he says, for the boomer elite? I'm not sure I understand that question, Dory. Is there a vacuum of, well, I, I don't know what. I'm just thinking back to his prior question, which was just retiring doesn't turn on the happy switch and that you can lose a sense of happiness and retire if retirement if you lose power and if you lose your sense of meaning. So I'm seeing it as related to that, that maybe that whole meaning making is so important. Yeah, it was the same person who asked this. So I'm thinking it's, I was just referring back to that other question. Maybe, Daniel, if we're not understanding the specific of this question, now maybe you'll be able to come on the fifth and we can talk more about it. What comes Sarah, up for me, oh, the word okay. empty. Go ahead. I think the word emptiness is one of those Rorschach tests we project onto. And mm -hmm. I have my own kind of associations with it, so I'm not sure if you're what you're referring to, but for me, I'm using the language of crossing the threshold from role to soul to, to refer to life beyond ego. To refer, I should say, to development, to human development, to this kind of this new stage of adult development that I'm trying to talk about beyond ego is also beyond the self sense of the doer. That there is a different kind of identity that is less self absorbed and less isolated inside the separateness. It is more expansive and more interconnected and attuned to soul. I'm not sure if he was, if that's what he was trying to get to or not. That's what comes up for me. Okay. 
That's important. And let's see, Sarah says, I'm also approaching, Sarah from Woodstock says, I'm also approaching 70 and still working. Great points about loss of income and releasing the doer. My plan is to volunteer with girls aging out of foster care. They may have similar fears of change. Wonderful. Oh, that's beautiful. Yes. So there's a rite of passage there for those girls where they will be in the old setting, in the old identity, and then they're going to step into a kind of uncertain, we could say empty, unknown place, the caterpillar going into the cocoon, and then they're going to emerge from foster care with a whole new identity. Hopefully, if they get guidance and support, they can emerge into the beginnings of their independence. And that's a rite of passage, very similar, because it has these universal qualities to it. Great point. I want to just, again, offer my email if you would like to be receiving the newsletter so that you know when my book comes out or when my workshops are happening, please email me at connieswide at gmail.com and I'll just put you on the mailing list. I don't send out stuff very often, but if you're interested in staying connected, that's the way to do it. That's great. And I just want you to know that Denise, who asked the question about what are the steps of the shadow, she said thank you. Beautiful answer from you, Connie, and it was so very helpful. So she just wanted Good. to give you that feedback. I just see that it is top of the hour, and I do want to remind everybody that on March 5th at noon Eastern Time, Connie is going to be joining with me from my Boomers and Beyond Special Interest Group, and any of you are invited, and it will be an opportunity to talk more. And I really do encourage you to connect with Connie and to become part of her mailing list and follow. I think my sense, Connie, is you offer a lovely approach and to... Uh, there's some more questions that have just come up here, so I'm just trying to decide about interesting. But you just offer a really beautiful approach of the importance of the inner, and it isn't just the changing the outer. And I just, I'm just i going to add one other thing. So Daniel clarifies. He says, not to worry today, but this is someone else's thesis. And he gives a it, – it's a website of www. A-S-A-G-I-N-G dot org slash blog slash baby hyphen boomers slash great slash expectation slash crisis slash meaning. And he says that it's about the crisis of meaning of purpose as a recurring theme about boomers. I'll send that to you, Connie, so you'll have it. Yeah, and, then, yeah. and Gary, wait, hold on one second. I was just printing that. Whole, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Hold on one minute. Whoops. There was one other question, but I may not be able to get that to you right now. And I do apologize for that. Let's see. Hold on one moment, if you don't mind. I'm here. No rush. Okay. I'm just trying to get back to this to see if I can get that question. Gary says, it takes more time and effort and concentration to keep up with all the tasks and developments, trying to keep up with complex technology, communication, and social media. I guess it's more of a statement than a question. Ah, uh, okay. So it does take a lot of time for all these things. Go ahead. Yeah, Connie. It does take a lot of time for all these things, yeah. <laughs> we have a choice in every moment of where we put our attention. And I think social media has its value. I was I had very kind of negative feelings about social media until I hired a high school girl in my neighborhood and had her mentor me, intergenerational mentoring, and teach me how to get past my phobia of clicking and get me using Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter. And now I'm totally enjoying myself. But <laughs> It has the capacity to take over, just like work does, and to distract us 
from other things. So it's really important to manage it and turn off the computer and keep it turned off for hours every day and don't check your phone. I have a client who never lets go of his phone and never stops checking it. Mm-hmm. And he's probably going to get a divorce because of that, because he's not present to his wife. It's true. It all takes time, and it's a choice in every moment where we, how we live our lives. And at the end of the day, that choice is added up. It's about our attention. It's true. Yep. Yeah. It's true. So before we sign off, I've had another request. If you would please repeat both the blog link as well as your email so people will have it. Okay, so my email is C O N I E Z as in zebra W E I G no punctuation just Connie's Wig at gmail dot com. And the blog is medium M E D I U M dot com and then slash to the right one Thank you all. This was really fun. Well, thank you. Any final, just last little takeaway you'd like to give, Connie, just to give you the last word? This has been wonderful, but just any last thought? I'm teaching workshops on Awakening the Sage Within. If you're interested, you can, mostly I'm teaching them in the L.A. area, but I will be traveling. If you're interested in that, you can let me know. Also, or just get on the mailing list. Also, this is not easy stuff, and it's not simple. It's not change your thinking, change your life. It's profound, and it brings to you a really a, a great self-knowledge and a sense of freedom from the shame of age. When you work with your inner ageist, you can really get free from the inner ageism that you're carrying and as a result I think you can find the treasure of this stage of life whether for you that means volunteering with young girls which is such a beautiful idea or whether it means becoming an activist for all of the causes that need our support now and really need elders. I have two friends who went to Standing Rock with all the young people and stood with them and got their backs. Whether it means a more contemplative life, learning a meditation practice, or taking up a creative dream. As I said, I've gone back to dancing and I'm just ecstatic with that now. Everybody, I think, has a creative dream that's been sacrificed, especially for work, but also for kids and family, and we can pick that up again now. People are painting and throwing pots and dancing and playing instruments and getting great joy. But if we deny the call, if we allow the resistance and the denial to win, all of those possibilities are closed to us. And we don't become who we really are, which is the promise of this stage of life. Thank you for... That sounds asking. like a great last word of holding on yeah. to the promise of this stage of life. Thank you so much, Connie. I think that it's just been wonderful. And there have been other comments coming in just thanking you for your inspiring words. So thank you again, Connie, for taking all this time. It's wonderful. And I'm looking forward to reading more of your blogs and your book when it comes out. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dory. Thank you, everybody. You've been listening to Revolutionize Your Retirement Radio with Dr. Dorian Mincer. To learn more about the resources mentioned on today's show, listen to past episodes, or download our free retirement transition guide, visit revolutionizeyourretirementradio.com.